everyone, and welcome to EduTalk. EduTalk is a bi-monthly virtual talk show created out of the need for a global learning community focused on topics in education that directly impact Caribbean nations and the diaspora nationals working across the globe. EduTalk features teachers, principals, administrators, business leaders, and dignitaries who share their expertise on critical topics facing education today with a common goal of moving education forward for our students. My name is Dr. Duane Dice. I'm your host. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Education Solutions International. Please visit educationsolutionsinternational.org to learn more about how ESI supports students, educators, and the school communities. And please subscribe to receive ESI updates. Today, we are very pleased to welcome to EduTalk, Mr. Philip Demetrius Charles Peneritis. He is a historian and an adjunct professor and a field supervisor at the, the Huntley College School of Education. He will be sharing with us about Shirley Chisholm, Claude McKay, and Stokely Carmichael in celebration of Caribbean Diaspora Month. This month is uh, Black History Month, but in EduTalk, we are actually sharing with everyone the concept of African diaspora. And so we want to thank everybody for joining us. We want to thank um, Philip for joining us for our wonderful discussion that will be on the way shortly. Before we begin, please, we, we are, we are pleased to, to share with you guys um, just a few details about um, Philip. He has been around for a very long time doing a whole lot for education and the people such as students and um, education uh, personnel and so on. So in 2014, he retired as director of social studies at the New York City Department of Education headquarters, where he um, hired, trained, and supervised over 50 teachers, curriculum writers, and coordinators, and coordinated the production of K-12 social studies passport curriculum guides. Uh, Mr. Peneritas supervised 54 mentor teachers who mentored over 800 new teachers annually in virtually every New York City public school. He also has worked in the Bronx High School um, Superintendent Office as the Social Studies Professional Development Specialist for 21 Bronx High Schools planning and presenting teacher, administrator, and parent training programs at district and citywide conferences. Five week summer uh, museum collaborations, uh, variety of after school and weekend district training programs and collaborations with Lehman College history professors. And Philip also, he earned his MA in curriculum and teaching from Columbia University Teachers College and his BA in history from Birmingham um, University, SUNY, that's here in um, New York City. Now for projects. Um, projects and publications that he has worked on. He co-founded, and later in a little while, I'm going to ask him to share with us uh, a little more detail about the Hunts Point Slave Burying Ground Project that's in the Bronx. And he co-authored an article on the history of supervision with Professor Francis Bolin in the Association um, of Curriculum and Development Journal. And he also wrote a book review of Michael um, W. Apple's Teachers and Text. He was awarded the awards and grants that he participated in and actually achieved 
In 1989, he is the Mr. Pinaritas lesson plan won first prize in a national contest called Lesson Planning for Democracy, co-sponsored by the American Federation of Teachers and the National Endowment for Democracy. He also wrote dozens of successful state and federal grant proposals that netted the district and the schools over $21 million. And in other fields, he is a seasoned traveler. He traveled to Florida, to California before settling in Alaska, where he worked on the transatlantic pipeline as a laborer, the doorman, bartender, bar manager, food and beverage manager, and general manager, and finally co-owned a bar and restaurant in Anchorage. So maybe someday someone of us can stop there, get some food and drink and reflect on this wonderful historian. Mr. Peneritas uh, lived in Europe as well as North Africa and has traveled extensively in Peru, Hong Kong, Hawaii, and China. It's very lengthy, um, uh, Philip. So um, welcome to EduTalk. And uh, I'm very personally, I'm very privileged to have you here with us to talk about um, history, black history, which is American history, actually. And um, I want you to share a little bit about yourself more than um, what I share here. And also um, tell us a little bit more about the co-founding of Hunts Point Slavery Burying uh, Ground Project. Well, it's an honor to be here, uh, Doctor, and thank you for that uh, lovely introduction, lengthy and lovely. <laughs> yes. Um, as far as the uh, Hunts Point, Hunts Point is a uh, area in the Bronx, and it's characterized by uh, environmental racism, really, uh, location of dozens of uh, incinerators that burn toxic waste. And the children there have the highest rates of asthma, the highest rates of uh, uh, incarceration among their parents. Uh, the recently just got the first supermarket. It was a, what they call a food desert. I could go on and on, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was an area that was known as known in the uh, 80s, 90s and uh, aughts uh, for its crime, uh, and the children there are almost all uh, what they call uh, free lunch. They're qualified. Oh, free that. and reduced. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a measure of family income. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, they. I was working in the history uh, department with the uh, Bronx uh, superintendent's office, and found a picture at Museum of City of New York where they showed something called the slave burial ground at Hunts Point. And I was familiar with the area and knew a little bit about the history, but never heard of such a thing. So in two years, my partner, Justin Zarka, who's a teacher there, uh, he and I and his children uh, examined uh, d documents uh, wills and maps and uh, uh, diaries and reconstructed the, the African-American community there, which were, as far as we know, all enslaved folks. Uh, and um, there were about 10 big estates and they all made money. Uh, we think of, uh, many of us here in New York think of slavery as something that happened in Mississippi or Alabama, but uh, the wealth of this peninsula uh, from before the revolution was generated on the backs of mm -hmm. enslaved Africans uh, who produced milk and wheat and cider and vegetables and many, many things that they had their own dock, their own little fleet of ships, mm -hmm. uh, boats really that took them down through the East River to the burgeoning community of New York City. And that was 
help to be fed on a regular basis by the uh, by the produce from Hunts Point. Today, Hunts Point. Uh, then, after the trains came there, it became a lower class uh, or working class, really, uh, uh, place. Uh, and then, in the 60s and 70s, there was many fires, and people mm -hmm. abandoned it. And uh, the half of it now is all industrial and wow. warehouses and things like that. Make a long story short, uh, the folks who lived there who were unknown, uh, at least to contemporary people, uh, the folks that lived there were often, um, they none of them could be buried in the cemetery. The cemetery of the white people that owned the plantations and owned the enslaved people is still there. Mm -hmm. It's suffered, uh, it's surrounded by a fence, it's owned by the Parks Department, um, and they're commemorated, those families who were very wealthy, they have streets named after them and all of that. But uh, we found uh, maps that showed, early maps, that across the way, across a road, mm -hmm. was a, um, where the uh, Negro, as it was called, the Negro uh, Cemetery, <clears throat> and of course, it, across the road can be in many different directions. So it took really two years for us to to find out and finally have it certified by uh, ground penetrating radar from the United States Department of Agriculture that uh, we had exactly uh, located the below the ground the remains of the Hunts Point slave burial ground. And so what had happened is that the Parks Department, so people visitors could get a better view of the river uh, and the superintendent said as much they graded away the the tombstones of the uh, enslaved people who were buried there and in the course of this project we established where it was we had a um, archaeologist come in wrote a report that confirmed our findings there was money that was set aside the committed to build a memorial the communities involved in that now, the local politicians, the AME church, uh, the congressman, the council woman, uh, all of those things. So that's in progress. We're in progress of getting, uh, getting landmark status for it. And it was just really nice because kids were involved in using the records that we found. And we put up a website, Justin put it up, that has everything that we found, the maps, all of those things. So it became a story that a lot of people wanted to be involved in because it wasn't just archaeology. It was a story about social justice, a story that said, you know, in 2020, uh, you can't, uh, 21 and 22, you can't just do that. You can't wipe out the memories and mm -hmm. the legacy of a whole community. So uh, the parks department, uh, we wrote part of the sign, the new sign that went up, and we're pleased that through the efforts of many, many allies, uh, none of us paid, that uh, they uh, have, in fact, been written back into history. And, and so that's been a, um, a wonderful project that people, uh, that people uh, have taken uh, uh, been happy to be involved in, and I'm very proud of the work that they did. And yeah, and yeah. that's very good. Yes, I'm. I'm very happy that um, you you influence all of that and take part in it to to make sure that legacy really speak for a long time into the future. Um, what what drove you to um, to get involved in history personally? Uh, it w my father was a uh, was born in Constantinople in uh, what became later the Turkish. But when he was born, it was the Ottoman Empire, and he came over here in 1915. And then he went in the American Navy uh, for over 10 years, including World War II. And uh, he was really, really interested in it, history and geography and. I would sit at his feet and listen to his stories and look at his black and white pictures of exotic places, uh, Hawaii and uh, North Africa and 
uh, all of the ships that he was on. And uh, he was uh, his own history of coming from the Ottoman Empire and then being a, uh, a laborer, a welder, and building a family, marrying a, a, a woman from here, uh, a Dutch American woman. All of that just called out uh, history for me. And so it was the stories he told and the life that we lived. Oh, wow. That in itself, um, many of us could identify with parts of that, you know, our journey. Wow. We, it's very rich, very rich. And it drives you to, to act. To, to let it become a part of your own life. So today we're, we're talking, we have to measure our, our talk because you have a wealth of knowledge. And so we're going to segment out for um, Shirley Chisholm and uh, um, Claude McKay, of course, and uh, Stokely Carmichael. So the first one that I wanted to reflect on is um, Shirley Chisholm, because we know Shirley Chisholm was a stalwart, um, one of the freshman members of Congress um, back in the days, and she caused some um, waves <laughs> in, our, in our history, in our Black history. So let me, before we start talking about her, I'm going to show a video of her, and then um, we'll pick up on the back end of it. How do you feel being the first Black woman you know, in the House of Representatives? <laughs> I have mixed feelings. First of all, I'm very glad to have been able to make history in this country by being the first black woman. And boys and girls, as far as I'm concerned, actually, it's overdue. There's so many things in the Congress I would like to change. I think the thing that I'd like to change more than anything else is the seniority system. The destiny of this country, which is primarily a young country, primarily peopled by younger people as a whole, is in the hands of about 50 men. 90% of them are from the South. The country is ruled by a group of old men that make up the Southern oligarchy. That's why this country is at its, as it is. I see myself as a potential reconciler on the American scene. Time will tell whether or not this will be so. From the moment she arrived in Washington, D.C., Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, her nickname was Fighting Shirley. Uh, but she also earned the respect of her fellow members of Congress. She went on to co-found the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, she even ran for president. Shirley Chisholm retired after 14 years in Congress. She was asked how she would like to be remembered. She responded that she did not want to go down in history as the nation's first black congresswoman. Rather, she said, quote, I'd like them to say that Shirley, that Shirley Chisholm had guts. That's how I'd like to be remembered. And that is, that is absolutely how she is remembered. After Shirley Chisholm's death in 2005, Congress commissioned a portrait of her. That's an honor typically reserved only for party leadership. But fighting Shirley is still there in the halls of Congress, keeping an eye out. And now over the past few weeks, Members of Congress's new freshman class, the most diverse freshman class Congress has ever seen, uh, they've been arriving at the Capitol and they've been doing their orientation and they've been setting up their staffs and their offices. And you know who keeps popping up these last couple of weeks? Yeah, thank God they put up that portrait. Because with Democrats picking up 40 new seats and sending Washington the most diverse and most female Congress ever, Past few weeks have been a time to remember and to honor the fact that Shirley Chisholm had guts. Coming up, we've had an interview. We okay, so we can stop it there. Um, so to, who, who was Shirley Chisholm? Let's start there. Who, who was she really? Well, she was, uh, first of all, uh, she was a person uh, with roots in Barbados. She was born in Brooklyn, uh, 1941, but she, early on, her parents sent her to her maternal grandmother in um, Christ Church in Barbados, where she attended a one-room school. And she later said that the fact that, that language came and words came easily to her was all because of the, the school teacher 
In fact, she became a school teacher and the portrait you see of her there is one of the, the more colorful outfits, but she was always, especially in the beginning of her career, always dressed in that school teacher, that high collar, long sleeves, the hair, the glasses, um, and always had that dignity and, and poise that, uh, that uh, she learned from uh, her teachers in Barbados. Um, she came back to Brooklyn when she was, um, after six years, and um, called herself a, a, a Bayesian, a person of mm -hmm. uh, descent from Barbados. Uh, the rest of her life, even though, of course, she was an American citizen born here. And um, later in her life, it's uh, to, just to jump ahead, it's, it's funny, she was so, first, let's get her, her roots. Her roots were, her father was from Guyana, a British, oh. uh, uh, it was a British colony, British Guyana, when he was born there, uh, part of the, the West Indies, even though it's on the mainland of South America. And he came to uh, the United States through Cuba, another largest island in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and met her mother, who was uh, who was born in met they met in Brooklyn, and the mother was from Barbados. So oh. there's uh, three or four different places uh, right there. At the end of her life, President Clinton, uh, she was in ill health. She was in Florida. He nominated her to be ambassador to Jamaica, which was a, a huge honor. And unfortunately, she declined that and had asked that her nomination be withdrawn because of uh, because of, of ill health. But uh, throughout her life, she she was uh, she fought for two things. And you see them on her uh, uh, one of the buttons for her presidential career in 19. A presidential campaign in 1974, 72, mm -hmm. and that was uh, women and uh, and racial equality. So uh -huh. she uh, went to girls' high school, which was a the uh, counterpart of boys' high school in Brooklyn. Very hard to get in. A very good education. She was uh, head of the honor society. She was offered a scholarship to. Um, to Vassar up on the Hudson and to Oberlin, a famous school with African-American attendance in Ohio. Uh, and unfortunately, the family uh, dad was uh, worked in a factory making burlap bags. And mom uh, was uh, worked as a home attendant. Uh, the family couldn't afford any of the, uh, the expenses. And she ended up going to Brooklyn College, which is part of the City University of New York. She graduated from there uh, and uh, with uh, summa cum laude. Mm -hmm. and, and later in her career, after working as a, as a, uh, as a pre-K teacher mm -hmm. and founding her own daycares, she went to Teachers College um, uh, at Columbia University, uh, mm -hmm. your alma mater, and... Uh, <laughs> Yes. and uh, graduated with, uh, with honors from there. So uh, she entered politics uh, in the New York State Legislature in the uh, 19, late 1950s, 1958. She served, she beat a uh, James Foreman in a, mm -hmm. uh, she was told, uh, why are you running? You're a woman. Uh, and she faced a lot of difficulties. She always said that her biggest difficulty, she said men are men, and meaning that her biggest difficulties came in the elections, uh, not so much from, she felt, from being a Black woman, but from being a woman at all. And uh, so she encountered throughout her career uh, and was became well-equipped to face and stand up to uh, stand up to misogyny and uh, racial prejudice. Yeah. Uh, she, she went on to serve seven terms in the U.S. Congress, which is difficult. That's uh, an election every two years. And um, wow. while she was in Congress she ch and, and New York State, she championed 
uh, many things that uh, today we would call progressive. She was an early advocate against, uh, excuse me, an early, uh, yeah, an advocate for withdrawal from Vietnam. She protested the, uh, she was anti-war. Mm -hmm. uh, she was an advocate for, in New York State and later in, uh, later in her career in the Congress, she was instrumental in getting uh, unemployment benefits uh, extended to to home health attendants. Mm -hmm. uh, she, in 1972, when she ran for president, uh, one of the uh, people in the primary she was running against was the uh, now infamous, I guess we can say, racist, uh, George Wallace, who got governor of Alabama. Uh, governor Wallace was, uh, had an assassination attempt, was shot several times, uh, the two days later, when he was uh, able to talk, one of his first visitors was Shirley yeah. Chisholm, and everyone thought that was kind of weird. But uh, two years later, when she was uh, marshalling support for for extending the unemployment benefits and getting um, getting childcare benefits passed through the Congress. The obstacle was in southern states, and she, uh, with the cooperate and Governor Wallace, went and helped grease the skids for that. So it was uh, it, it was uh, something that uh, a friendship that not a friendship necessarily, but a uh, but a a, uh, a partnership uh, that she was able to use well. So. Uh, she retired from politics and went on to, she was married twice, she got um, divorced, she got married uh, to a man she met in the assembly. Uh, they never had any children, either, uh, either spouse, she was always busy. Um, and after she, her work in government, she went on to do over a thousand speeches at, at colleges, churches, um, political groups around the country. Mm -hmm. During those for four years, she worked at Mount Holyoke, which is a, uh, a famous uh, uh, school, uh, college rather, for young women up uh, in the Springfield area in Massachusetts. Uh, she taught at Spelman College for a year down in Atlanta. A historically black uh, university, uh, and wrote many articles. Uh, towards the uh, end of her life, she, after her second husband died in an auto accident, she moved to um, she moved to uh, Florida. Do we have the slide with uh, that shows her uh, her button for presidential campaign? Uh, no, no, we, we don't have it here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was uh, interesting. It showed her face in the middle, and mm -hmm. then uh, the the words, uh, the logo was in pink. So uh, Kamala Harris, when she ran for yes. the campaign, she copied the same the same logo, and so. Oh. Women for pink and and uh, the face uh, was a black face. So yes, yes. What well, what do you, I know? They said um, finished they, fourth in the primaries. Yes, I know they they um Rachel Rachel said that um, her legacy. What when she asked about her legacy, she wants to be remembered as um, Shirley Chisholm has uh, guts. Uh, but in, in your estimation, what do you think her legacy is for uh, in, in this era now that we have, we're talking about race and, and, um, and black history. What do you think her legacy is? Well, I think her legacy is, and it's on her gravestone in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and it's the title of her first book, Unbossed and Unbought. Mm. And so uh, she went outside the party system uh, in Brooklyn, which was dominated by white men mm -hmm. and was successful for many years. And she was in a, in a polite but firm school teacher way. She uh, didn't accept uh, any 
to be treated in any second class way. Mm -hmm. She was bold, she was courageous. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, stood up for what she believed in and she never got rich. Uh, she never was involved in any real estate deals or any, uh, any of the things that we associate with bad politicians. So uh, I think she was a person of integrity and one of the first voices, uh, certainly the first elected uh, representative and the first person in the Democratic Party to actually go to a debate uh, way, before, uh, way before today. So uh, yeah. It's good. It's the um, okay, so uh, she, uh, we would say she has lived, uh, including family and private life, as well as public life, and then she gives back to not just her small communities um, coming from a Caribbean background or many different Caribbean backgrounds. She, she spoke fluent Spanish. Wow. Was, for, for, all the, for all the things that she was involved in that had that might be considered a black cause or a cause for women or something that was from the West Indies. Mm -hmm. She, the district she ran in and Bedford Stuyvesant was gerrymandered. Mm -hmm. So that to, you had to, there were Hasidic Jewish people. There were uh, many immigrants from Latin America and Puerto Rico and, uh, and Dominican Republic. So. Mm -hmm. She had to be successful. She had to make her case to all sorts of people, including men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Strong, the other... strong woman. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so yeah, I appreciate you sharing about um, Shirley Chisholm. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Claude McKay. And Claude McKay is a, was an extraordinary man. Um, he, he stood up in adversity relating to education. Um, right, so, so Claude McKay contributed a lot to education based on his being a poet and a novelist. And one of the good things about it now, just in this moment, is the fact that he's Jamaican, just like myself, and, and coming to the diaspora and contributing so much to, um, to, to writing, writing in itself, um, literature. So before, before we go into the poem that we're gonna share with everyone, um, Philip, can you just give us a, a small background to, to Claude McKay? Well, Claude McKay was born in Jamaica in Clarendon Parish, the equivalent of what we would call a county here. And um, he was born in 1890. Um, he, uh, came, he won several prizes in Jamaica for his poetry. He was sent uh, to live with his brother, who was a teacher uh, at a uh, church and school uh, when he was four years old, and he lived with the brother uh, until he was nine. He started writing poetry when he was age 10, when he was um, 19... Uh, he was 16 years old and he won two prizes with some cash uh, in Jamaica. And he was noted for writing in Patois. Mm. He, he wrote sonnets, Shakespearean style um, uh, forms uh, in the language that the most ordinary Jamaicans mm. spoke. So that was a departure from the, the English of, uh, of Great Britain. Yeah. And he came to the United States in uh, 1916. Uh, he was, um, uh, he worked as a, well, first he went to college in, uh, he went to college in uh, uh, Tuskegee Institute for a little while down in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, and he, uh, re he didn't really get along with the military regimen there. He went to Kansas State. Mm -hmm. He earned um, high marks, but he left that for the big city, and he moved to uh, he moved to New York City, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, during the 
era uh, right before World War I. And it was a time that's known in US history as the Great Migration and Harlem was the queen city on the East Coast of, uh, of uh, all sorts of artists and writers and musicians. And he uh, swam in that water and uh, turned out to be a big fish with, uh, <laughs> yeah. with, he started out as a poet. And then, as you said, he moved on to write, uh, to write novels and, and many other things. But uh, today he's remembered for, for all of that. And, and particularly, I think the poetry as, as a man, he, he was a socialist. Uh, he became a socialist after he read and, and a, uh, if we could call him, I guess, a black nationalist and also a pan-Africanist like, uh, uh, like the famous Jamaican Mark, who also lived in Harlem at the time, uh, Marcus Garvey Marcus, yeah. and, um, and United Negro Improvement uh, Association which McKay was, was associated with. McKay became the editor of a, a magazine owned by Max Eastman from the movie Reds and, mm -hmm. uh, and Liberator was, uh, was just what it said. It was a, uh, a magazine for uh, socialist uh, liberation of, uh, of the proletariat and of people that were, that were vexed by racism. Mm -hmm. So, so he has done his fair share um, traveling. Um, it, is, is it that his mother and father were Jamaicans? Um, I believe so. I believe so, okay. yes. So he's still and, yeah, but he did a lot of traveling. He left for London, cert certainly, uh, right after that. He lived there. He wrote in the, uh, in, for the British press and for the expat. Uh, mm -hmm. West Indian community, which was mm -hmm. already uh, big in, in the British Isles yeah. and, getting, and getting bigger. He was then invited to attend one of the internationals, uh, the Communist Party in, uh, in uh, Moscow. He, was, uh, he lived uh, for six months or so in the Soviet Union, and he was, he was beloved there. He was treated like a rock star. Mm -hmm. um, people were familiar with his poetry. He wrote two uh, histories of uh, Negro life uh, in America that were translated uh, into Russian mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he moved on to Hamburg, to Paris, to uh, Barcelona, and finally to Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, he came back to uh, he came back to the United States, again to Harlem, mm -hmm. and uh, later in his life, he moved to Michigan. He was, uh, he was uh, impoverished at one point, and he was, uh, he was assisted by people from the uh, Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic movement to help uh, poor people. And oh. he, uh, he changed his, he was an atheist most of his young life. Okay. born a Baptist mm -hmm. and uh, then became a Methodist. And finally, he uh, worked as a Catholic. He moved to Chicago, worked in a Catholic school and um, passed away out there in 1948. Wow. No, that's not right. Um, yeah, I think in 1940s. Yeah. Okay. 1948. Yeah, right. 1948. Yeah, he, he's mostly considered if if you're a school child, mm -hmm. if you're a high school or junior high uh, kid in the United States, you encounter him as one of the founders, and and really he was. His poems were one of the first expressions of a movement of a mm -hmm. cultural movement called the Harlem Renaissance. Yes, yes, I I remember that growing up in school, and there. There's a school in Jamaica that is actually named after him, a high school called McKinney. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, before I have one more question to ask um, about him for you to elaborate on, but let's take in um, one of his poems that he, he, he actually voiced it um, back in the days. So let's hear from- This is, this is gonna be the, uh, 
Tropics in New York. Tropics in, in New York, the title. His, his, his homesickness. And then we're going to hear If We Must Die, which is probably his most famous poem. Mm -hmm. okay. It is the poem that makes me a poet among colored Americans. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious pot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. Bow down my soul in worship very low, and in the holy silences be lost. Bow down before the marble man of woe. Bow down before the singing angel host. What jeweled glory fills my spirit's eye? What golden grandeur moves the depths of me? The soaring arches lift me up on high, taking my breath with their rare symmetry. Bow down my soul and let the wondrous light of beauty bathe thee from her lofty throne. Bow down before the wonder of man's might. Bow down in worship, humble. All right, I think we can stop there. All right, what, in, in terms of his journey, um, and you mentioned um, the philosophy of Marcus Garvey, do you think other people around this era uh, or the ideas of the time, how they influence him, maybe back in Jamaica as well as in the U.S., what do you think some of those ideas um, are that influence him to, to write some of these ones? Well, part of it was, as you say, uh, Jamaica and uh, Pan-Africanism, uh, which certainly he saw in England and in his travels around the United States, uh, as well as the Caribbean. Uh, he, uh, the first poem that he read, If We Must Die, just to put that in context, that's, um, that is in response. He wrote that in 1919, mm -hmm. and uh, that was known in America as the Red Summer, and it was the Red Summer because it was a time when, of backlash, when the FBI uh, uh, began smashing uh, socialist and uh, peace groups and especially anything that was uh, black American that was organized. It was after, right after uh, World War I and the Great Migration had put many thousands and thousands of, uh, of African Americans from the deep south were now working and living in Chicago and Milwaukee and Toledo and New York and and Buffalo and every place in between in the North. And there was a backlash to that. Uh, soldiers came home and found that, that a black man was working and had the job that they wanted and uh, was uh, rubbing shoulders with them. And so while the North was uh, the where abolition began, it was different when African-Americans uh, actually were living next to you. And so there were some horrible massacres in Elaine, Arkansas that year, uh, in East St. Louis, in Chicago, three days of terror where the police couldn't protect anyone. Mob might, they called it a riot, but it was a white riot. Mm -hmm. It was where white gangs came in with guns and, and firebombs and and for three days burned uh, Chicago, hundreds of, of African-Americans killed. Uh, and so this is what this is a response to, if we must die. And it was at that point, there really were people dying on a regular basis uh, from the 
repression. So well, that's what he, uh, that's what this is in response to. Yeah. And, I, I remember I remember that poem when I was in high school. They, we actually recited it in Jamaica. To oh, it was named uh, 1977, named uh, the National Poet of Jamaica. Yes, yes. All right. Um, because of time, uh, we're we're going to just leave him there for until another time. Do you want to get to um, Stokely Carmichael? And Stokely Carmichael was a wonderful figure. I just learned about him um, just this past couple of days his philosophy and ideas that he was, he was um, communicating. He's a very, very um, deep guy. And I, I want us to spend a little bit of time on him um, looking at what he stood for um, in terms of black history. So let, um, let, let's watch the, the video first and then we'll come back and pick up in, on the back end of it. As we see the video pays attention to his speaking style is considered, is still considered a, a master of uh, or, orator and speaker. Yes. man's definitions is what we find ourselves trapped by. His definitions of what is good and what is bad. His definitions of what is reasonable and what is unreasonable. His definitions of what is savagery and what is not savagery. And that is perhaps where we've really been trapped because the white man has been subtly making us hate ourselves. The white man has been playing God for centuries. And the reason he's played God for centuries is because we've met him. It's time for us to tell him that playtime is over. It's time for us to let him know that we will no longer tolerate his nonsense. It is time for us to let him know that we are forging together for our struggle for humanity and every time he touches one of the peoples in the third world, he's going to go to war with all of us, wherever we are. That's what we have to tell him. One simple question here, Philip. Who, where was he from? Who was he really? Well, he was born in Trinidad, uh, which is a multiracial society. He was, uh, uh, his parents had lived there for many years. Um, he came to New York. Uh, again, with all three of these folks, there's a, a period in their life when they either grow up in the West Indies or they're sent back to the West Indies to go to school. Uh, Stokely, uh, you can hear a little bit of the Caribbean lilt in his voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was there for his part of his formative years. And then he came and he uh, lived on Amistad Street, where his uh, about two blocks from where I live in Morris Park. He recalled in his biography, he was a mentor, a member of the the only black member of the Morris Park Dukes, a, uh, a, we would call him a street gang that did petty crimes and uh, mostly Italian at that point. The neighborhood was Italian. His dad was a, uh, a cab driver and a carpenter. His mother was a stewardess on, uh, on uh, cruise ships that left New York for the Caribbean. Uh, he had a uh, several sisters, strong family, 
uh, he went to uh, local schools and then he got into what uh, into a school called Bronx, the Bronx High School of Science, which is uh, one of the, you have to take several tests and it's really for gifted and talented uh, children. And he got in there and in those four years, he was very, very successful. He, he won a number of awards for his speaking. He was captain of the soccer team. Um, he met many, he swam in the white world, in the white intellectual world of, of smart kids from Manhattan and Brooklyn that went there and uh, was exposed to, to socialism. He sat in the front row at a Malcolm X uh, uh, speech and was mesmerized. Uh, he uh, was offered scholarships to Princeton University and um, uh, instead he went to a historically black college, one of the most famous ones in the country at Howard University in uh, Washington, DC, where he, uh, he thrived again. Uh, had a, his English teacher was Toni Morrison. Uh, he uh, achieved great grades, but in between during the summers, he he uh, was one of the, he was marching from the very first, from 1961, mm -hmm. he was marching in uh, the South. He joined something called SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, he later became chairman of. Um, John Lewis preceded him. Mm -hmm. uh, he graduated on time, but he spent a summer in most of it in Parchman Prison in uh, in Mississippi, where he was arrested uh, during uh, for riding buses during the the the, um, the summer of protest in 1963, riding buses with uh, other black and white students in SNCC. And they would go from, they went from Virginia to New Orleans, buses and trains, and they would get off and go into the bus station and walk into the white, uh, into the white uh, dining room, mm -hmm. the white bathrooms. And they had been trained by uh, James Lawton and, and others in uh, Gandhian techniques. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Yeah. Wow. Why, why? So was he a part of the Black Panther movement? Well, he actually started in Lowndes County, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, he had he did work there. He got rid of his uh, fancy clothes and he wore overalls and he went out and talked to farmers and helped register over 2,500 Black people in a county that was 80% Black and had almost zero uh, registrants because oh. of Jim Crow voter registration laws mm -hmm. and um, led he was with King on the march the James Meredith march after Meredith the first black man to integrate the University of Mississippi after Meredith was shot mm -hmm. the, that's why they were marching across the Edmund Pettus bridge mm -hmm. he was he got to know uh, he and King were uh, separated by a generation but they got along well even though he was much more, uh, much more confrontational, for lack of a better word, than King was. He took mm -hmm. more risks. He said uh, he was the first one to, King was still talking about Negroes and Stokely was talking about Black people and later African American people, mm -hmm. uh, just as a, as a, where they were was were different places, and and Stokely also, especially with the Black Panther. So in Lowndes County, they uh, the symbol of the White Democratic Party, which had zero the people that controlled the Democrats, and it was a Democratic state then, but a different type of Democrat. Their symbol was a white rooster, an all white rooster, and so to stand up to them, they formed formed their own version of the Democratic Party. Eventually took power and the symbol of that was the Black Panther. Mm -hmm. So that started with, with uh, Carmichael in Alabama and then 
migrated to uh, to Bobby Seale and uh, and Huey Newton and Oak, the streets of Oakland, uh, California, and the uh, eventual spread around the country of the Panther programs, uh, which not only included uh, free breakfast for children and educational programs, but also standing up to uh, standing up to if you're not being nonviolent all the time. If you're threatened by uh, people with guns, then arm yourself. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that the Panthers did and they intimidated. Stokely scared the heck out of, uh, <laughs> uh, he was a tall, dark skinned man that wore sunglasses. Yeah. He, uh, he wasn't afraid to say anything. Uh, and- It, kind of, it reminds me of uh, Malcolm X. Is his oh, approach, yeah. his demeanor, it looks just like that. Yeah. Yep, yep. And um, uh, as a result, you know, after the, after the, uh, there was a movie, uh, Judas, uh, oh, about uh, killing Fred Hampton. And yes. it was just on, pretty good movie. And uh, in the movie, you see that, that uh, the head of the FBI it goes all the way back to the summer of the, the Red Summer. Uh, the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, was looking, for, had called Hampton the Black Messiah, and he was sure there was a Black Messiah coming, and it scared the heck out of him and the law, the white law enforcement community. Well, after Hampton was killed, they focused on Stokely. Stokely was the one that was identified as the most charismatic and the most threatening to, um, to the vested interest of the uh, political, economic, cultural, uh, basically white patriarchy in America. Mm -hmm. uh, so they uh, wiretapped Stokely, they uh, tried to, they did everything they could to foment dissension between mm -hmm. him and other black leaders. Mm -hmm. And were partly the reason that in 1969, He departed uh, for living. Uh, he was back and forth every year. He would come to America, but he lived in, in uh, first in Ghana and then in Guinea, and, uh, and married uh, Miriam Makeba, who was a world famous uh, singer from South Africa, mm -hmm. singer and uh, and political uh, advocate. Uh, had two children. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moved to Guinea, and both of the, in this was in just recently uh, post-colonial Africa, and so the the figures that had struggled were uh, were Sesu Seko Ture mm -hmm. in Guinea, and uh, and Kwame Nkrumah mm -hmm. in in uh Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah was living in Guinea because he had been overthrown by a US backed military coup so Stokely lived among both of those men who were a little older than him and were also they were both pan africanists they saw the problems that needed to be solved as as ones that were continent wide not just within their uh Ghana was a, had been a British colony. Uh, Guinea had been a French colony. So, mm -hmm. um, and then he took the name. He changed his name and to Kwame uh, mm -hmm. Ture, T U R E. So yeah. when when he died in 1968, um, he uh, no, that's not true. He died in 1998. Okay, yeah, 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 98. When he died in 98. Mm -hmm. He had been coming over here for treatment for many years for a cancer that he he uh, believed the CIA had something to do with. Oh. But um, when he died, that was the name that he had, Kwame Ture. Oh. He, continue, he continued to fight bravely. He traveled around the world, uh, including during the Vietnam. He was one of the first leaders in the 60s to, st mm -hmm. way before Martin Luther King did, to stand up and make coalitions with white uh, students for a democratic society, uh, all those uh, so-called radical white student leaders and making common cause for civil rights and for peace in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, he traveled just like 
just like Jane Fonda did, uh, he <laughs> traveled to North Vietnam when we were fighting against North Vietnam and, um, and tried, to, uh, tried to establish people to people peace yes. initiatives. So he also traveled to Cuba. He spent uh, three days in the, in the, the prime in in, uh, in yeah. Castro with uh, Fidel Castro. So another place in the Caribbean, uh, he he was uh, with uh, he made common cause with the New Jewel movement, a socialist mm -hmm. uh, Pan African movement in uh, Grenada. Yes. So he he was he had his pulse on the finger of the Atlantic world uh, yeah. when it came to revolution in and when it came to pan-africanism and um and the destruction of of white patriarchy and 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 neo-colonialism yeah wow it's rich rich richness um sharing about these three people um he was so, funny too he yeah he, he threw his in in videos you would see him throw his head back and laugh there's a there was a movie um, there was a movie about um, the an undercover agent in Colorado. I can't remember it was uh, the name of it, but um, an undercover black uh, he was a black cop and he mm -hmm. the, he was supposed to defuse white uh, excuse me black radicals that came to town and spot oh. on them. Remember Is that? It, yeah, yeah. Is it the Ku Klux Klan movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. He yeah. joined. He joined the Ku Klux Klan as a white guy. I oh. mean, on, the, on the phone. Yes, and yes, then, yes. And then there's a white actor who jo who actually did join. Yeah. Um, to meet up with them. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Well, in the movie, the the speaker that comes to town right. and and talks is is Stokely Carmichael. Is an oh. actor playing Stokely Carmichael, and that's a true story. He came, oh, wow. to, he came to that Colorado. I think it was in Boulder. Came to uh, Colorado and spoke. He went around the country, speaking at colleges, uh, talking about and explaining, and and getting people involved and mm -hmm. asking them to stand up and 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 take chances and mm -hmm. and speak the truth. Yeah. So. so yeah. Um, you know, he we was could an easy go. person. He was an easy person for the for, for them to to be forgotten because yeah. he was, he was uh, compared to, you know, one of the things. If you look at the civil rights movement, you uh, eventually, when they signed the voter rights, uh, when LBJ uh, did that in 1965 and gave the pen to Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. it was the 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 white uh, establishment. People like Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael said it, it became okay. You can either deal with Martin Luther King, who they thought originally was a huge threat, mm -hmm. or we have Stokely here and Malcolm X. You want to deal with them, and of course they wanted nothing to do with <laughs> with uh, the that was too frightening to yes. deal with him. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I learned I so much about them. Um, so they, um, among the three that we have looked at, we have, we have looked at um, Shirley Chisholm and uh, Claude McKay, as well as um, Stokely Carmichael. These three ones that we focus on in our talk um, today or, or this evening. Um, how, how do you see the Caribbean in terms of history? How do you yeah. see the Caribbean contributing a lot or contributed a lot to American history. So much, so much. And we just picked three. We could yeah. go on. We could go on. There's so many from the from the very beginning of our country. Uh, the the farms around here, we talked about the Hunts Point and further up on the Hudson, the Phillips Manor, mm -hmm. a huge plantation, and a guy, Frederick Phillips with two P's, Dutch spelling. Mm -hmm. uh, and he actually went and was a slaver, brought, brought enslaved people from, Af from the west coast of Africa. And later when the British patrols went all the way around to the Indian Ocean to Madagascar. Mm -hmm. But what were the, how did they make their money? And see, this isn't really taught in school. 
but how they made their money yes. um, on the backs of the, the enslaved people was selling, doing their own triangular trade with the West Indies. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that this country revolted was that the British insisted that they only trade not with Haiti or San, San Dominique, mm, yeah. but with, but with um, British colonies when they could get a better price in, in French colonies or Spanish colonies. So the trade up and down the coast from Boston to Charleston and, and especially out of New York and, and the Hudson River. And what did we take there? We took all of these farms that Phillips had that he, he was taking cider mm -hmm. and he was taking wheat and things that didn't grow in Jamaica, could have mm -hmm. grown there, but they were using all the land they had in Jamaica to, okay. to, to, to grow sugar and coffee yeah. and, yeah. and ex, export crops. Right, right. So, so the elite were being fed in butter and, and things like that. Uh, they would take in the winter when it was cold. Uh, so they made lots and lots of money. And on the way back, after they sold that to the elites in Barbados and Grenada and, and, and Jamaica, uh, they would come back with molasses, which they mm -hmm. would come from. Yes. And they would come back with enslaved Africans. Most of the people, most of the enslaved people in the north here didn't come on ships from Africa. They came from places, intermediary places like Cuba, Jamaica, and Barbados, yeah. and had originally come from Africa to land there. So um, those ties are, and people just don't realize it. From the very beginning, this country has been involved in what's called the Atlantic world, and a big focus of it, whether it was uh, the, the Boston people selling cod, Mm -hmm. low grade cod that they couldn't sell to the white people in Europe they would take and it would to the and slit to the slavers in Jamaica and yeah. that, became, that became food for sustenance for the enslaved population so this country and especially in the north has had a strong economic relationship with um, uh, ties that are inseparable w from slavery and from the West Indies, and yeah. that's seldom taught and seldom realized. Mm -hmm. But uh, and also, West Indian people like Marcus Garvey, uh, uh, like Reverend Galamison here in New York, uh, mm -hmm. have been at the forefront of of uh, Black liberation and civil rights movies uh, mm -hmm. movements, rather. And I'm not sure that's well known in Jamaica. It's certainly no. not well known here. It, it, people might know Stokely Carmichael and Shirley Chisholm and 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 um, Claude McKay, but whether they know that they're parts of both worlds, yes, I'm not sure. They don't know because when I was in school too, we we didn't really talk about them as being part of both worlds, and mm -hmm. we we hardly know anything about um, Carmichael, hardly. Right. Um, Claude McKay, we knew about the school. When, and the poet and the, maybe one or two poems that he wrote, but not his story at all. We don't know. Right. The students here don't even know the full story about Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. so we, we have to close off here, but um, we're gonna get you back on the program um, for quite a few more times to talk history and, and just share just like what we do when we were younger around a fireplace, you know, eat and roast meat and share and drink. Um, so thank you so much. Philip, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on um, today and share with us uh, a little bit of Black history, American history and Caribbean history to tied up in there. And thank you so much for our viewers. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you for subscribing and thank you for everything that you do in your littlest ways to um, forward education. Please visit educationsolutionsinternational.org to subscribe and receive updates about ESI initiatives, resources, and events. You can also watch recordings of this video as well as other videos on the ESI YouTube page at Education Solutions International TV. Um, take care, everybody, and thank you so much, um, Philip, for coming on again, and we're going to see you 
um, again in in um, in other videos. Thank you everybody for watching and have a good evening. Bye everybody. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. yeah.